everyone, hello and welcome along. How are we doing? Can everybody see me okay? And hear me okay? Hopefully everything's all right. Um, little comment box. We're gonna go into the, the, click on the private. On your side, it should say private chat. Uh, you can click comments in there. The public one is not on. Uh, but just let me know you can see and hear everything for me, if you don't mind. So, so I'm sure it's working. I've got the recording on as well. Um, yeah, are we? Can you can you see in here, guys? Not seeing anything coming through. You're all scared to scared to type in. What it uh, should have should have on. Can see and hear. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, was this, everything looked okay on my side, but just checking. But yeah, don't be don't be scared scared to ask to jump in with uh, comments, guys. I have turned it off on the, on the public side. Cause some people don't like sharing it uh, in front of everybody, so it is it is the private. You're in the private tab, in through there, and no one can see but myself. So don't be worried about asking silly questions or anything in front of people. Uh, it's only me because you can you can ask silly questions in front of me, no problem. Okay, guys, um, I've been asked, this is a different webinar, I've been asked to do this webinar from, uh, by James Bentley. Um, the guys over over there have asked me to, to take a few of their clients that have come on board uh, and to take them through what we do uh, or have on our site. So a little introduction to what we have here uh, at Markets Made Clear. Uh, a few of you... Uh, few others that are already clients of, as well and familiar with the site. It'll just be a nice little introduction for you, um, take you through some, what some of the numbers are um, and how you can begin to use it in a little more detail. Okay, as we're going through, uh, as always, uh, by all means, jump in with questions, guys, and say, stick on the comments uh, and you'll get more from it. There will be a recording of this at the end, um, so you can view that as well as we go along. So, okay. Um, so what have we got? Mark's made clear. What is it all about? What have we got on our site? There's three main elements to our site. Um, it's the equipment of traders data would definitely would be the, the central part of the site and the, the forefront of what we do and what we're try, trying to keep pushing towards traders because we uh, believe in the, 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 the importance and the significance of the data that we have. Um, after, along with that, we have the seasonal, seasonal data, seasonal charts and statistics. And then finally, more, more recent addition, as you're already part of it, but, uh, this is uh, MMC TV. We do a, a weekly webinar uh, where we tend to go through analysis, combining, looking at these uh, both two elements, equipment of traders and the seasonal charts, and also just looking at charts in general, looking at technical analysis, et cetera, and trying to put it all together. I'll just, have, just go on to the site. Now, have you all been on the site before? I'm assuming you have, some of, some of you may not, actually some of you could be quite new. Um, so if you haven't been on before, so whenever you log in, uh, you can see I'm logged in through here. Whenever you log in, uh, you're confronted by this to begin with, um, this numbers. And essentially this is the commitment of traders report. This is the raw data that we uh, get. I'll go through in a little bit of detail, a little bit more detail in a minute, what the commitment of traders is uh, and where it comes from, et cetera. But essentially this is the actual report that we that is downloaded from the uh, exchange um, or from CFTC every week. Uh, and then we use these data, uh, these, these numbers to put together our charts uh, and our extremes, which we'll be going through in a, in a second whenever they decide to, to load up. Um, other than that, in the seasonality section, through here, we just click on that. That takes you through to the seasonal heat map, which I'll go through in a, in a second as well. And also there's the seasonal um, seasonal graphs. So I'll just, take, just talk you through, and then I'll click on this, but it'll probably play me, and it will have a, a loop around. But yeah, you'll, you'll see that I don't want it to play that. Because I'll just hear myself in a loop going round and round and round. Um, you're accessing this uh, this webinar, and you would do that. Let me go over to that. There we go. Uh, accessing this webinar. Most of you are accessing this webinar via a link that has been emailed out. 
Uh, but actually, MMC TV operates via where you just log in and it's there live and it starts automatically, and no link required each week. So, by all means, feel free to jump in there every week. There'll be at least one every Monday at 8 p.m. Um, there will be other special webinars um, at different times, but you'll see them in the calendar. So, you can't go in there whenever I'm actually live because it. Uh, and you'll just get a, a feedback loop. It's a bit annoying. But you spend a bit of time in there, and that's where all the recordings are kept as well. Uh, the recordings are usually up with about three or four hours after a webinar is uh, completed. And you can go in there, and there's a whole uh, catalogue of the last 15 or 18 webinars. I can't remember exactly the number, but there's quite, there's quite a catalogue that you can go through in there. There's also quite a few things that you'll find on our YouTube ch channel, uh, monthly videos, and a bit more. That'll be quite a useful one for you, uh, a bit more info. Uh, in terms of what we're going through tonight. Uh, what is the equipment of traders? This this recording actually goes through a little bit more detail uh, than what we're going to go into tonight. Um, I'm going to assume that you guys that are on tonight have know nothing about equipment of traders, so I'm just going to give it a sort of a general intro to it uh, and how to access the numbers on the site where this this webinar or this recording here uh, goes into a bit more detail, so you'd quite find it quite useful to go into after we do tonight. Okay, so that's on the, the YouTube channel as well okay all right let's start with a little bit of information of what the commitment of traders is the commitment of traders uh, report is compiled by the commodity futures trading commission uh, known as the cftc uh, they're a, a government body in the uh, u.s uh, and the, they compile it every week, and it's the only record of buying and selling activity that is available to traders. They say it's compiled every week, and it's released every Friday, typically on a Friday, unless it coincides with a public holiday, uh, but it's a Friday. You'll see the dates on the slide. The date that comes through there is the date of the last uh, release. Um, uh, it's updated the same. It's usually it's, it's, it's 3 p.m. Uh, Eastern time, so it's around about 11 o'clock on a Friday night, that which the, the, site, the site actually updates the time we pull it through and, and uh, look at the data. That's when we get that through uh, there. So you'll see that date refers to the release. Uh, okay, so it's released every Friday and details every long uh, buy and, and short position that's still active in the market. So these are not intraday positions a trader could, be, could have bought and sold within the day or within the period uh, and actually is, is gone. You'll not see that position. Um, that's intraday volume and they will not be recorded. So it's only what is left uh, and actually what was known as still active that can still have an impact in the market. That's what we can still see. Generally, larger traders or don't sit, or don't be in and out as that quick and larger positions actually stay in for weeks and months. And they're the ones that really drive and influence the market uh, direction long term. Intraday positions just try to take advantage of that uh, movement on a shorter term basis, uh, but they don't actually influence its long term direction. Uh, the main thing to to know and understand when it comes to cut data is uh, the way the report categorizes traders and how it's broken down into different into different into different categories. Uh, the report categorizes each trader based on his or her positions, and the categories are based on their purpose for being in the market. This purpose is very, very important. We're going to take a, uh, that's what I'm going to try to focus on this evening so you can understand primarily what the, the cut data is showing us. The purpose is important, and, and it's the purpose for being in the market and actually having the positions, i.e., is it business or speculation? You and I, your speculation um so you will always be generally uh, going in line with what the especially if you're a trend if you're a trend based trader you will be in line with the positions most associated with the, spe the speculation and the speculative uh, traders the business which we'll look at as well business is essentially why the markets exist in the first place um the actual activity of buy buying and exchange and exchanging the wrong goods we're just trading over the top of that 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 uh, uh but it's actually with the market's there to facilitate trade. Um, so this is the most important element. I've been able to understand the business and speculation purposes and understand the, sort of the categories of the traders, uh, different categories of the traders. So that's what I say I'm going to focus on trying to nail down tonight. Okay, so who can we actually see? Business or, or speculation? The main distinction between traders and, and cut is whether they use the market for business or speculation. As I've said, three categories. The categories are as follows. You have commercial and then you have the non-commercial and non-reportable. Generally, there's a slight distinction between the, these, but you can see uh, both of these, non-commercial and non-reportable, they are both 
speculation. Uh, it's just based on the size of the uh, trade that's being placed. So there's very there's a lot of money being placed in here. They have to go to certain reporting levels. I'll not get into the detail of that. But generally, if, if you and I were report, trading in the futures market, you, we would generally be in there. So it's basically sort of roughly of a, tr a trade under the value of about 100,000. Uh, so you're having to be a rather large institution before you have an individual trade of that sort of a uh, that sort of magnitude. But they are both the same. They're both in the market trying to make money based on its future direction and solely making money from the movement and its price. Commercial, on the other hand, we are we definitely do not uh, operate like this. Commercial entities are only they use the market for facilitating trade uh, and offsetting risk that they have within their business. They're not looking to make money from the appreciation or depreciation directly from the market in the raw material. Yes, think of a think of gold miners, for example, or oil. Uh, Oil companies, etc. These are the people that are in the market and operate as a commercial. They have they have a, an interest or own an asset, and they are in the market for commercial purposes. Uh, they do not profit directly from the markets, as in this from the, from the uh, they profit from the actual movement or the actual physical value, the physical product, not from from the. Uh, value appreciation of the uh, financial asset as itself. Okay, so those are the two main uh, differences. Generally, we're going to be looking at commercial groups and non-commercial, non-reportable. We won't really be uh, looking at because they tend to be a fairly uneducated bunch of people and tend to be wrong, and there's no real consistency within it. But there is three groups that you will see. Say whenever you go on to the data, you will see the three of them here on the site. You will see there's the data relating to the commercials, non-reportable, non-commercials, and the non-reportables. Okay, so say, but generally, the two main groups we'll be looking at will be the data here and here. We tend to ignore, to a large extent, what the guys are actually saying. You can typically see their positions are much, much smaller, uh, and they have very little impact in the market. Okay. So the three three groups, or they say, but primarily the two we're going to be focusing on. What uh, what are they? Uh, as I've already said a little bit about, about them, but uh, commercial commercial describes an entity involved in the production, or processing, or merchandising of a commodity uh, using futures contracts primarily for hedging. Typically, uh, they are trend starters and enders. They're typ typically to try and put it into perspective. These guys are sort of what set the value or understand the value of a market. You think again? I always try to relate it back to. A, uh, a product, think of a gold miner. The gold miner will understand the gold market better than anybody sitting in a bank. Yeah, they will, he will know the value, he or she will know the value of uh, the gold that he's digging out of the ground. He knows what it costs to dig it out of the ground, the processing of it, and he knows what its uh, intrinsic value is. Uh, and they typically set the value of it. Don't, don't physically uh, actually set the value, but they will, they're, Activities within the, within the market pretty much dictates the value of a market, whether they think uh, it's too it's too high or too cheap. Their trading will typically then set the tone and try to change the direction. If it's too cheap, they'll try to buy it and set it higher. And if it's too expensive, they'll sell it and set it lower. Um, so yeah, that's typically what they do. In between times, uh, and essentially what we do is we will follow the trend. Uh, and that's what non-commercials do. They are traders such as hedge funds and institutions, and they use the futures market uh, for speculative purposes, typically trend followers. If a market is trending higher, they will buy it. If it's trending lower, they will sell it. Yeah, uh, and that's typically how you and I would understand the markets, because that's exactly what we try to do as well. For the most part, some of you may be trying to pick tops and bottoms and major trends and stuff like that, but generally, we'll be following the trend. Uh, that's exactly what, uh, most banks, hedge funds, and institutions are going to be doing on the trading side, and that's what they try to do as well. Uh, um, so, who should we follow? Uh, do we do we look at what these guys are doing, or do we look at what these guys are doing? Always get asked that question um, because they will typically be doing two opposite things. If a market is trending up, these guys will be selling it, and these guys will be buying it. So, who can you follow? There will always be a buyer and a seller. If it goes up. These commercials will be selling it directly to these guys. Uh, so therefore, who do you follow? Let's try and understand exactly a little bit more information uh, about what they're doing. We we'll look at speculators first. How do speculators behave in the market? Here I've got a chart that's coming from, I'll just open up the same piece. If we go into our caught charts section.
Give me a second. I'll just bring up the, the same bit that I have in the slide. I'll bring it up here in the charts just so we can look in a little bit more detail in here. Uh, so we've got pound data and the element of the section that I was looking that we're looking at in the presentation is this element here, this little uptrend that we're going to be looking at. We'll look at the presentation and I'll come back in. So you can see here speculators within how they operate within the uptrend. You'll see pounds uptrend through here from the uh, from May right through for about a year. It goes into May the following following year. So we've got a year, so obviously a weekly chart. Uh, so there's a lot of data through here, but you can see nice uptrend, bit of a consolidation at the base, and then we start to trend up quite nicely. Now looking at speculators, if you again thinking about how we would trade, uh, if this is in an uptrend, we'd be looking to buy. You'd be looking to buy into these kind of areas here, and here you'd be looking to continue to buy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And that's exactly what speculators, banks, hedge funds, and uh, in institutions try to do the same. You'll see the green at the bottom. You'll see these two lines at the bottom. Which you'll see on the site refers to the long, and that's the number of long contracts, the number of short contracts. So the amount of buying and selling that's been done. This is the number of the contracts bought, number of contracts sold, and it's presented each each week is presented in the, the value in this line. And as I say you'll see the buying green line as the trend continues to move higher, they continue to buy more. The green line increases. The numbers so they will buy more as it goes up and they will sell less you'll see the red line the amount that they're selling will go down uh, as a price as the market starts to trend higher you see it increased when they would market was actually going down they were selling more so that's exactly what we would do on a weekly basis you see a weekly chart like that on a downtrend you'll be selling it and uh, when it turns to start to go up you start to buy okay so it's fairly straightforward okay same again here in the euro you'll see a trending lower they're selling more and they're buying less uh, you'll see they never go to zero on, on any side. There's always a, a holding of some of some sort. A lot of these can be held for quite a long period of time. Okay, so that's fairly straightforward. And that's the speculators that you see on the, the uh, within the cut charts, and they are at the bottom here. Non-commercials. They're known as the non-commercials, and that is their positions there. Uh, we get three lines. Three lines showing in here. We've got the long. Uh, I'll just you can turn them off. Say so there. There you've got the number of long contracts. The green line. The number of short contracts is the red line, and the number is the net, which is the difference between the two. You'll hear a lot of people talking about the uh, net positions. When people talk about cut data, they'll say they're net long or net short. My preference is always to actually look at the detail uh, uh, in it rather than look at the difference between the two values. I actually want to see uh, the actual values themselves and what's really going on and through there. And there's exactly the same period that I was just referring to. So I just turn that off again. You'll see the buying increase. As we're going up in the trend, and if I just turn around the other way, turn on the shorts, you'll see the selling decrease as the trend moves higher. So that's typically what we would understand and how we would trade as well. The little complicated bit is the commercials. This is where it tends to confuse people a little bit because it's the opposite to what they would do. They can't get, sort of get their head around why are they do, they're doing that. Just remember that these guys, when it comes to uh, business or in here, say the commercial, you'll see the commercials compositions here are the commercial. Um, okay, they are they are not trying to make money in the market that we you and I do. Okay, so don't think they're losing money. I'm clicking there on the wrong button. No, I'm go back here. They own a product, so as it goes up in value, they will sell it. If you think you've got a shed full of gold, which would be nice, uh, whenever it's down here at this price, you're not going to sell your gold. You're going to keep it in the shed, uh, as you any normal person would, would keep their gold in their shed. You keep it there until it increases in value. Uh, and if gold was in that, that price, you're going to be much more happy to sell it at this price than you were here. So you'll see that as the market goes up in value, they actually sell more. Exactly opposite to what we've seen uh, the speculators do, the non-commercials, and what we would generally do. We would not be selling as the market goes higher. But these guys aren't losing any money from it as it goes higher. They're actually selling it direct. They're pocketing the actual raw value. If they sell it at 1300 they get 1300 and that's that's it. So it's not that they're losing and it's going against them. Uh, but they will sell as a market appreciates in value, and they will buy less. Not interested in buying here. You'll be buying your gold at a cheap price and selling it as an expensive. Uh, again, you'll see we're trending down. They will start to buy more, and they will sell less. Does that make sense? Tends to be the element of cut data 
that, that confuses most people because it's not uh, it's the exact opposite of how they they uh, would consider trading themselves. It's how we were generally maybe thought, would think of the markets and uh, initially before we maybe started trading, you know, by buy, buy, buy low, sell high. Um, but that's exactly what you do if you would physically own you own the gold, you own the copper, you own the wheat. That's how you'd perform. So it's the exact opposite to how we would. Uh, or how we typically would operate in the market. Another mar uh, example here of copper, uh, as the market moves lower, they are selling less and buying more. It's worth less. I'm not gonna sell sell it down here. Whenever I was getting much more for it, I'll let it go back up again and sell more at a higher price. Okay, does that make sense? A little bit of co context for you. So how should we follow? Uh, both 60, no group should be ignored. Uh, should always try to take the context of what each group positions are relative to the chart. Where are we within the chart? Should we be buy, should um, commercials be selling? Should speculators be buying? And that we will understand that from the chart. Are we at a relative high to where we have been? Or are we at a relative low to where we have been? And we can understand then the positions that we're seeing and how they're behaving. Um, Based on that, say, are we at a relative high or a low? Should how should each group be behaving? Uh, and we can actually take a read a lot into that. An example being, oh, sorry, go back. An example being recently, uh, we can look at gold actually now. Uh, we're at a relative low in gold, and we can read a lot into the positions we're seeing at the moment. You'd expect if we are come to a relative low, the commercials would typically be buying. You would expect them to be typically buying that. But if you actually look at the position, so I just zoom this up. Oh, sorry, I turned off too many. Turn that. They actually aren't buying down here. They stopped buying. We peaked around here. They actually decreased the amount of law, uh, buying that they were doing, which is quite bearish for gold, and which is why we haven't seen a big turnaround yet the way we typically would. They aren't buying it. They have set, they would typically set the value and step in and actually try to drive a market higher. And they haven't done that. Okay, so we can read a lot. I'll not go into the full detail of exactly how to interpret all the numbers. I just want to give you an understanding uh, of what to, how they should be behaving and what to look into. So generally, we will be in line with what these guys are doing, the non commercial. Uh, but it's these guys that actually set the value. Is this market cheap or is this expensive? Uh, Etc. And that's what we typically be looking at. Any any questions? On that as I say, just want to give a brief understanding of what the two groups are. Because I say when you come in and you you're confronted with all these lines, try to understand what's actually going on. Which of these sites should you be looking at? Uh, this is the context. You are uh, you will all be doing a a course with myself in the new in the new year. I will obviously be going into this in a lot more detail and help put it all into context. Um, but tonight is just to give you a bit of an understanding of what we're, what you're going to, look, what you're confronted with, and if you come on here, because uh, there seems to be a lot going on. It's just really to help to put a bit of a basis. But the course uh, in the new year, uh, and also if you want to join, as uh, many of the, the, my weekly webinars on the Monday night, by all means join, join those, and I will always go through the uh, what are the interesting points from each weekly update of the COT. So I'll be going through those as well. So you will pick up a lot. So there definitely will still be questions after tonight. Uh, tonight's just to give you to uh, a broad uh, introduction to what it is and how to navigate around on this site. Um, another set of numbers that are of interest, uh, one of the first ones I look at is, is this section here, is the weekly change in positions. Uh, and the ones that are of interest, you'll see this one here, orange, and if I turn off, you'll see it flashing. That means there's been a big change in the positions um, from, last, from last week, uh, and you'll see that's the Mexican peso on this one. There's a big decrease. Typically, you'll see if you want to get an into a bit of an explanation. If you click on the little question marks at the top, it gives you a little bit of an intro, uh, intro to what it actually is. But what, what that's saying is that's say the biggest change in this last 12 months, um, and that's why it's, it's flashing like that. Uh, and it's the biggest decrease in the non-commercial longs. So they stopped buying by a significant amount. Uh, and if you if you go and actually look at the uh, Mexican peso, uh, you will see that it's been moving higher. It's been getting so a dollar of Mexican peso was moving higher. So the Mexican peso was actually being sold quite heavily. So they stopped buying, um, which is indicative of pushing that trend to the downtrend that we have in uh, in the Mexican peso. 
Uh, Rachel, yes, that will be that is the course in, ja in January in London. Yes. Yep. Okay, so that's that's uh, a section. One of the sections I look at first each week. Uh, another section I look at is the extremes section. These areas here, the all-time highs, the all-time lows. We don't oh, do we have an all-time low. We don't have an all-time high. I'll have an all-time low, but we have uh, ATH, which is an all-time high. Uh, we don't have any this week, but there will be other sections that will be highlighted, and it will say ATL, which is an all-time low. Um, typically, if I sort of a just uh, illustrate why extremes are important. Um, whenever a market has been uh, let me just try, I'm trying to bring up. Whenever a market has been trending like this, we have a beginning of a trend. Perhaps we were in a, in a long term downtrend through here. These areas here where we tend to see extremes in, in the market, in the positions. When you see an uptrend like that, you'll typically find the most number of buyers uh, occur in a market at the end of it. Yeah, so you get really, really large number uh, of positions at the end of a, of a trend, whether it be an uptrend or a downtrend. Um, so that's what say, uh, extremes typically signify. Uh, and that's why you want to be sort of highlighted whenever you, whenever I come on each week, I want to see what, what markets have reached extremes. So we see an extreme, it's typically uh, uh, an indication that we're coming to the end of a move. Um, just go back in to see what, in, uh, what extremes we have. This, this ex current extreme we have on is the US Treasury, it's 10 year Treasury, five year Treasury. A lot of these probably don't trade those, um, and wheat as well. Going back this last couple of weeks, we have had extremes in the New Zealand dollar. Okay, we can't see them now, but there have been extremes in the New Zealand dollar. And as we know, the Kiwis just started, made a low and starting to move higher. Um, so we got the indication from the position. We could see the positions. Actually, if I just go up. I'll just show you the positions of Kiwi just to illustrate. Uh, it'll be a market you are familiar with. If I just bring it in and let's look at the extremes in the positions. Uh, look at commercials again. We're going to look at commercials. They are the ones that typically start and end a trend. So they will be selling up here and they'll be buying down here. If I just show you that commercial data, turn this over and across through here. Look at the amount of buying that was done here by the commercials, by people that actually physically invested in the New Zealand dollar, whether it's for trade, uh, the farmers there, uh, corporations there that need uh, New Zealand dollars in order to facilitate trade. They were doing the most buying here than they've ever done in the in the history. And if you, see, if you look at the relative highs, obviously that would have been the, uh, an all-time high at that period in time. Uh, and then this would have been an all-time high, and this would have been an all-time high. And you see the always occur, just find the line that up, that's there, that's there, and we've just had this one here. So that's a kind of indication that we're getting, that's, what, that's where extremes in positions are really, really important, and that's at the point where commercials become uh, a step in. We would follow what the non-commercials would do generally, say at the time when we a market gets to an extreme, that's the signal that the trend is going to end. Um, and we need to be aware of that and say that we just were seeing the Kiwi. Now, it took a bit of time. It turned a little bit quicker. The period we got into these areas turned a little bit quicker. It took a little bit of time in through here. We're now seeing Kiwi turn and we're seeing that trend break. And it's because of the extreme in the positions that we see there. Okay. Uh, so that's the value of the extremes. But what we're seeing there is the actual, is the numbers. The ex, uh, the extreme just gives you that it gives you the high level number that that we can then see on the chart. So you can get the extreme from here because it's easy just to, to note down. I'll typically take a note of what the extremes are and then go in back into the charts and actually go and see what the what the chart is telling me. Okay, does that, does that generally make sense, guys? Yeah, I'd say uh, still a lot to go through. Um, but I just want to give you a broader understanding so you can sort of navigate your way through the, the main data. Generally, the first thing I will do when I come in will be look at the extremes and note down where the extremes are, come into charts. It's usually a bit quicker loading than this. Uh, and I will check to see where the big weekly swings have been, uh, whether somebody's leaving a market or coming into a market typically changes direction. Uh, investigate 
the actual charts themselves with that information. Okay. Um, if you're new, and I'm guessing you are new to, you're all new to COT data, um, try and think of the chart first. Um, so don't come in and just look at every single list or everything that's flashing because it'll get confusing. Try to think of a chart. Try to think of a context. I want to sell something or I want to buy something. Um, and come in and look at the positions and see if they relate, uh, if the positions relate to that. Uh, or speculators buying it uh, as you want to, et cetera, et cetera. So try to do that rather than just coming in and looking at the data first because it will get it quite confusing. Okay. The other section, which will be very useful and it's uh, probably be a little bit easier to understand at this stage before the cut data, and it's one of the first things I looked at. Uh, I looked at before cut data myself when I very first started uh, investigating all this many, many moons ago. Um, the seasonal charts. Seasonal data. Everybody understand see seasonality is uh, generally any market, any market, whether it be the euro or wheat or gold, it has a particular tendency at certain times of the year to, to experience greater supply or demand, uh, and those patterns tend to repeat because it gets it, uh, it has those forces uh, applied to it time, time and time again. Um, so that's what seasonality is. It's looking at the, the each individual market and trying to identify when those periods typically are. Same. It doesn't not every market doesn't move exactly the same every year, but there are patterns within its movement that uh, that are strong enough to give us a bias to how a market would typically move during a given period of time. Um, and that's what seasonality is. And if you can see the price action and you combine it with uh, what we've seen in COT, um, it gives us a strong indication that it's trying to do the same thing again this time around. So it gives us a heads up so we can plan for it. Um, what we generally have here, before going to the cut charts, a little heat map, this is the performance of each individual market from month to month and how it typically performs. So in, in January, I'll start with the Aussie dollar. January, historically, uh, the Australian dollar is typically ends January lower than when it starts. So that's from the month to month, how it typically performs. So you can see how it typically performs through the year. April's tends to be a really strong month for the Australian dollar, as uh, does it typically be for quite a lot of the currencies, followed then by one of the weakest months, which is May. So it just gives you a slight heads up, but if you actually go to back through and look at some of the charts, it's, it's crazy to see how many of these patterns you see uh, happening over and over. So it's just a little heads up. This is something I look at the beginning, generally the first weekend of every month. Uh, and it gives me a heads up typically to see where the biggest movements will be. A lot of these markets may be typically towards the bottom. You probably don't trade, um, but it's definitely worth looking at. And it's some, some of the things we do actually see some of the biggest and strongest moves in. But if you want to concentrate on the ones you're more familiar with to begin with, that's fine. Um, so what I'd be taking from this at the moment, you'll see a big batch of green in here. Uh, and these are related to the indices. You've got the uh, Dow Jones and NASDAQ and the S&P. Typically, equities do really well in November. Uh, typically, make a bit of a low. You can see August, September tends to be quite rough. Um, August was, wasn't actually that bad this year. It tended uh, that down, that downward move we typically get didn't actually occur until a little bit later, which was uh, October, which we've just seen. And now we're making that low and starting to go back, which we typically do in the lead up to Christmas. Uh, so we're on through from about, about mid-November. Uh, right through to uh, early this early January, just after Christmas, actually. So that's what you would get from that. Look for the most interesting uh, numbers, the biggest numbers, and you can simply see there's a Japanese yen on the currency side of things. Japanese yen is typically the weakest currency through through November, and we know the, the Japanese yen has been. Those numbers show you historically month to month. You can actually come in and check out the full chart. Go in there. And then this shows you the chart. There's two lines on each seasonal chart. And start here with the dollar index. Two lines are one is the blue line is the historical average. So it's every year uh, and it's the average of each, uh, each individual year and the pattern in which it produces. The yellow line is a weighted average so that we can check to see the argument with seasonal data. Say there only is, you see the amount of data you have dollar index obviously we only created whenever the euro was created um very different before then we only have 19 years of data it was 1999 the euro was created so it's not that much uh, data you can see there uh, we've got 29 years for the australian dollar pounds probably the longest 42 years of uh, history 
you have here for uh, the British pound. And the argument with seasonality is, um, how do we know you're doing the same thing uh, this year that we did uh, back in 1974 or whatever? Um, so that argument makes sense. How do, how do you check that? And that's what we use the weighted average for, to check to see if the pattern is still happening today the way it was 20, 30, uh, 40 years ago, whatever that data is. Um, so the yellow line gives more weighting to recent years as opposed to just looking at a uh, true average. Think of it a bit like a exponential moving average as opposed to a simple moving average. Simple moving average just is the period divided by or the the average divided by the, 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 period, the period you're looking at and you get that average, whereas an exponential is actually weighted more to recent price. Uh, and if there's a difference to uh, in it, then we know that the, the price has actually changed. And we can see that but what we're bro broadly looking at here, we're looking for is periods where they're still the same. And that tells us that the pound is moving exactly the same today than what it did 20, 30, 40 years ago. Um, so it gives us a much stronger indication of what we're trying to do. So those periods with the two align are really, really good. Um, I mentioned earlier on about April been really strong for the Aussie dollar and with number of currencies you see the typical big move through there. Uh, July is also typically a really strong month um, for the British pound. And then, but in recent years we've seen a divergence slightly. Uh, we know the pound has been in quite a significant downtrend in recent years uh, and that's been, uh, we can see that from the divergence between the two lines but generally we'll still see peaks and troughs in the two. You see the troughs there, the two, so just the downward move is stronger. Uh, than, than what we generally get, but they typically line up. So see, you still see a movement, but the downward uh, leg of it has been stronger in recent years. So that's what we're looking at. But essentially, we were, uh, the ideal is to find periods where both are the same. Um, so looking through this at the moment, if you're trying to look forward into the next, towards the end of the year, if you look at the, do the dollar index, uh, you'll see the US dollar typically performs really well through August. Uh, August and or August, sorry, October and into November, and it has been. It's been from for a moment longer, a little bit, uh, bit longer than that. But we're coming very close to what we would typically associate to the end, uh, and when we typically see dollar weakness again. Uh, and it's interesting if you check your charts. If you haven't checked them already, uh, if you're checking them later tonight, we've seen a big key day uh, reversal on the dollar. We did have an hour ago the last time I looked at the charts. Um, and it's coming right slap buying in the middle of November. I say typical reversals around the sort of 16th, 17th of uh, November, and we're getting very close to that. Uh, and that's so that's what seasonality does. It's not a guarantee. The dollar index does not have to turn around and go down. Definitely does not. Um, but it allows us to sort of plan ahead. Should I still be buying the dollar after the strength that we've had? And this would indicate to me that, that uh, we should start to see a reversal and the dollar actually lose strength. On the opposite side of that. Typically, whenever the, uh, the exact, uh, exact opposite of the dollar will always be the euro. Uh, so if the dollar is going to weaken from now, this is when you would typically expect to see lows in the euro. We know the euro has been weak. Uh, we typically see a low in the euro and actually perform very nicely into year end December. Uh, and I don't know why. I don't know why and I don't really care, to be honest. Uh, always People always ask me why uh, a market does this a particular year. I haven't looked into it. I don't really find why it does it but the the euro is typically uh, performs very well in December um, I but I say as I have actually no idea why that would be and I don't really mind but the see that's what seasonal charts is giving us the heads up so we can look in the future the cot data tells us what's happening now um, and generally we'd be looking at the positions predominantly from commercials they should be buying into this we've seen a slight increase in the commercial buying but not uh, huge extremes but we'll have a look again this week when it comes out on Friday uh, but we can combine the two together seasonality giving us the context of what we might do in the future cock data is telling us what we are doing if we combine the two together uh, it gives us a very very powerful insight to what we're typically going to do okay so we've got lots of markets in through here just navigate your way through as you come on um, crude oil is an interesting one we've seen pretty much an uptrend we typically make a low in february and a high at the beginning of october and if you look at the crude oil chart that's exactly what we've done we had a, the low of the year was mid-february the high of the year we're actually about three days before three days before the seasonal high and um, we're typically weak down through october november and if you're familiar with the crude oil chart you know it has pretty much tanked this last three four weeks um but about early december 
we start to make uh, a bit obviously a bit of a fight back. So that's a, a chart possibly looking on a weekly on a weekly basis and looking for some uh, buying opportunities in the next week. Probably a little bit early yet. Might see a little bounces, but I'd say the lows probably not that far away. Uh, so it just gives you the context of what we should be looking at. So take a bit of time and go through, say a few of the, the grains and the softs, maybe some of the meats. Probably not familiar with tra trading, uh, but so stick with the ones that you're familiar with. But by all means, uh, play around and through there and see what you can find some more interesting things. Okay, uh, what have we got? Uh, the seasonal charts are definitely a lot easier to understand than the cut charts. Uh, there's a lot more information and there's a lot more power to be taken from the cut data, as I say. Is, let's see. The seasonal charts are just what we generally have a tendency to do. Um, but that doesn't say we're going to do it at that point in time, whereas the cut data will show us actually what's happening right now. So we're trying to understand that and interpret the data. Uh, there's a lot more uh, power in the cut data than the seasonality. Um, but combining the two, it gives uh, one gives us a context for the other. It'll take a bit of time. It took me a little bit of time to understand the cut. Um, but it's very, once you get into it, it's actually pretty straightforward because you know what to go and look for and what to expect. And that's the key to it. If you can. Uh, if you think of the context of the chart and then go and see what we should be, anticipate what you should be seeing in, in the terms of the cut data, it actually makes the cut a lot easier rather than, as I said, don't just go into the cut data and start looking at all the numbers and trying to wonder, is it going to go up or down? Uh, that's where it gets really confusing. Look at the chart first and then try to uh, back up what should be happening on the chart from the positions that we get in cut. Okay, but uh, yeah, if, uh, if I was going to say which which element of the uh, which part of the site to spend a bit of time on to begin with? I would say this is the seasonal the seasonal charts. So it's going to be the easiest to understand. It's going to be the easiest to bolt on to your uh, to your trading at this stage, uh, and then we can add on the the cut data as we go through it and say we'll go into a lot more de uh, detail uh, in the course in the new year. Uh, as I say, and then the other section is the live stream. I'm not going to that again. We'll say all the uh, you. Do, you're going to join every every week or whatever you, you can. There's no no links will be sent out. You simply uh, log in on, on the site, click on to the MMC TV, and it will automatically start at uh, at 8 p.m. Um, so yeah, no links, no emails, no reminders. A lot more straightforward, a lot easier, and uh, it's live in there. You'll see the calendar of when they're going to be coming up, uh, and also all the recordings are in there. So it's, it's a lot more straightforward and easier to understand. Um, the, what's the best way to improve uh, my understanding of cut, the cut charts? Um, I would say start with going a little bit more detail. I mentioned there earlier this this video. That's a recording I made. Uh, it's not that long ago, actually. So yeah, three months ago. <laughs> um, and I'm going to say a bit more detail uh, than what I've went into tonight. Um, so make make your way through that if you want to. Then send me, if you want to send me a few emails, a few questions. Uh, by all means, do that. But I'll, I'll go through a lot of it. It's not that long until uh, January now, so I'll, I'll be going through a lot of the detail and taking you through it then. But familiarise yourself with that with that video. Spend time with with the charts if you're if you're able to. Uh, think of key charts that you're looking at. Maybe the euro, maybe the dollar index, maybe gold charts that you're you're looking at, and then try to interpret what you're seeing um, from the positions, whether it be commercials or non-commercials. Uh, and you'll start to see it's just like looking at patterns. The same way you read a uh, a candlestick chart or a, or a bar chart, you'll start to see patterns of behavior in the uh, cut data, and that's all, all it is. We're looking at behavior behaviors of different groups of traders and what they're doing and why they're doing it, uh, and that's what we're essentially reading into. Why are they buying? Why are they selling? Why are they, why are they not buying? Uh, the example of gold uh, at the moment. Uh, commercials aren't buying, which is why it isn't going up at the velocity a lot of people had ex uh, people had expected. Um, so that's essentially what we're doing. We're just reading the, the behaviours and the patterns of what uh, traders are doing. Okay, uh, so that's the the, the elements. Say the cut, cut data. If you want to go back into cut, you can just click on the the logo. It takes you back to the main members homepage. And say. Raw numbers taken from the report every week. I don't spend much time in, in this. You can come in and actually check what the numbers are, and what the past numbers have, have been. I don't spend much time with that. Go straight into the actually go straight into the extremes. Where I typically, as I said, go in here, see what extremes are, because that's when we're going to typically see major highs and lows uh, of markets, and take a note of those, and then go back into the cut charts. 
and I say that. But that's start with the, the charts you're familiar with, uh, and so you've got context. Rather than just going down every single the one here, because it'll uh, you could you could just spend hours and hours, and it's not going to help you to do that. And then the seasonality. So I'd actually probably recommend to spend more time with the seasonality to begin with, so you have a better understanding of what's going on in there, and it's easier to interpret. And just plan ahead. Typically, where I would go in. I remember most of them. I've been looking at seasonality for a good few years, and I remember quite a lot of them um, off uh, offhand, so I don't need to go in and check all the time. But generally, trying to get into a habit of going into the seasonal charts once a month, sort of the last weekend uh, of each month. So they're sort of around the, the, the way it's funny. So this month, so the first first second, around, around that period, I'll go in, I'll check everything for December. Uh, where's the biggest moves when the wind when throughout the month do we typically make those moves? And then make, make a mark on your chart around the date, around that period. Uh, so you'll typically see we typically make a low at this period, we typically make a high at this period. Uh, and just allows you to plan ahead and interpret and or anticipate what, we're, what we might see on uh, the chart going forward. Uh, as I say, there is uh, a few really good examples. So let me see if I can go. Oh. I'll just uh, show you what I have done. The dollar index, you can see the actual date here. I have the dates because I've obviously compiled the statistics, but you can see from the, within the month, it's sort of towards just after the middle. So right this, I mean, if you had it marked the 15th, that's fine, but so it's around the 16th, 17th. Um, and if I go into the dollar, uh, go into the dollar index around, let me see. Here I have it marked on the chart. That's what that line is, just there. Okay, so yeah, it just allows you to put a bit of context and say there's the reverse. Or we are seeing a reversal bar at the moment. Um, no guarantee it's going to go down, but it's interesting it's now coinciding uh, towards the peak, and when we're anticipating the seasonal peak as well. Uh, where do we get a log in for the website? James will send that out. Rachel, if he hasn't already, I'll speak to. I'll send him an email. Um, I'll get James to do that for you. Uh, I'll get him to do that tomorrow. Okay. Uh, all right, guys. Uh, any questions? What have we got? Any questions on that? I know a few of you have been on some of my weekly weekly webinars already, so you may be familiar with some of it. Um, but yeah, any questions or anything you want me to go over? To say that it will be. The recording will be available. Uh, I'll actually send it over to James so we can send it out in an, in an email along with uh, that, that one as well. Actually, so you can go through and that goes into a bit more detail. Uh, but hopefully tonight is giving you a bit of an understanding what it is you have here on, on this site and how to navigate it, uh, your way around to begin with. Uh, and hopefully over the coming weeks and months, it'll make a little bit more sense for you. Okay. Any questions or are we... Typically, how many pips does the dollar fall in November? So that's coming from the seasonal move here. Seasonality doesn't tell you the size of any particular move. It tells you the likely direction over a period of time. It might be 100 pips from here to here, or it could be 1,000 pips. Uh, it's put it again in the context of the chart. If we were in a downtrend, you'd expect to see this move a lot stronger because we'd see a lot more selling. But we've actually been in an uptrend so the typical uh, seasonal weakness may not be as weak as what we would typically expect. So always take it in the context of the chart. Don't uh, consider uh, the actual magnitude. It's not here to tell us the, uh, the magnitude of a move. It's a uh, likely direction of it. You may say, say, if we are in an uptrend, if we are in an uptrend through this period or generally throughout this period, you'll see the up move being a lot stronger. We may be in a down period through our seasonal weakness through here. But if we're in a strong uptrend, you might actually see just something like this uh, and then actually start to move up. So the up leg would be a lot stronger than the down leg, whereas if we're in a downtrend, uh, typically sort of been a phase two, you might see something like this and then the, the leg down being a lot stronger. So try to think of it in the context of that and don't don't try to work out uh, whether it'll move 200 pips, 300 pips, that type of thing. It's not magnitude, it's more direction of the move. But by all means, go back through, go back through the charts, open up your chart. Uh, 
you know, go into a, a, a weekly or a monthly and see when that pattern, pattern has happened, the size of the magnet there, uh, all the histories on your charts. These, uh, these seasonal charts are just putting it there in a, in a, in a graph for you. Okay. No problem. No problem. Anything else, guys? Say so ho hopefully tonight it's giving you a bit of a bit of an uh, understanding and a bit of an introduction to what we can see here. Uh, there's a lot more. See, there is a lot going on with respect, uh, in the charts, and, and we'll take a bit of time if you are new to it to try and understand it. But the main the main point is is understanding the the groups that we're seeing the commercials and the non-commercials. Why do we have uh, the two? Why are they there? Uh, what are they typically showing us? Um, and which which one to follow at particular times. Um, so when you come in here, it does. It seems like an awful lot going on. Um, but once you put the context of the chart, it's actually a lot more straightforward. And that's what we'll go into the detail in the in the course in January is how to interpret it all and where to take action. Essentially, okay. All right, guys. Well, thanks very much for joining in. I uh, hope you find that useful. Say if you, you should have my email. Um, if you don't. Um, you will you will be sent out an email tomorrow anyway with the recordings. I'll make sure my details are on that. Um, so if you have any questions, by all means, just drop us an email. If you haven't got logins, uh, I will I will make sure James has those as well tomorrow. Uh, and then you can access all, everything you've seen here tonight: the cut data, seasonality, and the the live streaming each Monday. Okay. So say thanks very much for joining in. Um, I will see you if you want. You can join in next Monday. Um, to the weekly webinar or by all means navigate your way spend some time with the cot data and i will look forward to hopefully meeting you all in january okay all the best guys enjoy the rest of your evening i'll talk to you soon